Good evening, friends, and welcome to Sleepy Time Tales, a podcast aimed at helping you to get a good night's sleep. Do you find your mind plagued with the stresses of modern life, especially when the lights are out and you're trying to get a restful night? Does your spinning mind keep you awake? Follow my voice down the path towards a good night's rest. Listen to me tell a story that will keep your mind from wandering to your daytime problems. The ones that you can't solve right now and will be easier to solve while rested. Listen to my voice and allow yourself to drift, following the twists and turns of the story but slowly letting go and drifting into sleep. A quick note for new listeners. If this is your first time joining us, part of the plan with the show is this long intro, which usually goes on for roughly 15 minutes. If if you want to get straight to the story, there's a timestamp in the show description that will get you straight there. But aside from the little bit of of promotion I'm about to go into, into, the intro does serve a purpose, which I'll get into in a few minutes. Now most podcasts put their promotion and cup rattling halfway through the show or towards the end. But because I'm hoping that you're asleep before we get there, I need to put this stuff up front. So for those who stuck around, I'd like to talk about our official sponsor. Mental health is quite important to me. I speak sometimes about insomnia as both a cause and consequence of mental health issues like anxiety, which is something I suffer from. I don't like to overstake my issues with anxiety because a lot of people have it worse, but it's still real and there's several nights that it's keeping me awake. So if you suffer anxiety or any other issues or feel like you need to talk to someone for whatever reason, try out BetterHelp. That's H-E-L-P. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. Once signing up, you can start communicating in under 24 hours. BetterHelp is not a crisis line. It is not self-help. It is professional counseling done securely online. There's a broad range of expertise in BetterHelp's counselor network. Sometimes this may not be available locally because not every person can access the relevant people that they need to help them. The service is available for clients worldwide. You can log into your account anytime and send a message to your counsellor. You'll get timely and thoughtful responses, plus you can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. So you won't ever have to sit in an uncomfortable waiting room as with traditional therapy. People often struggle to find a counsellor with whom they really get on with and who really understands them. So BetterHelp makes this easier by making it easy and free to change counsellors if needed. It is more affordable than traditional offline counselling and financial aid is available. BetterHelp wants you to start living a happier life today. Visit trybetterhelp.com slash sleepytime. That's trybetterhelp.com slash sleepytime and join the over 500,000 people taking charge of their mental health with the help of an experienced professional. There's a special offer for Sleepy Time Tales listeners who get 10% off their first month at trybetterhelp.com slash sleepytime. And if uh, signing up for therapy seems like a difficult way to uh, support Sleepy Time Tales, there are other options for you. If the show, if you're finding that the show helps you to get a good night's sleep, whether weekly, nightly, or however often you listen, and you would like to help me to keep the show running and available for free, I'd like to ask you to consider signing up at patreon.com slash sleepytimetales, which is linked in the show notes, to support the work that I do and help Sleepy Time Tales to continue to help yourself and others. It's not something I've spoken about recently, but I really would love to do this full time. I'd love to produce at least twice as many episodes and help help reach as many people. And um, I can only do that with listener support. So if you're interested in, and you're inclined and you're interested in the bonuses that are available for supporters on the Patreon, take a look. The support level levels there that give a little sweetener to everybody. So other than the satisfaction of helping the show to grow and reach more people, there are bonuses from shoutouts, bonus episodes, and special edits of the episodes. And as a sweetener for, I've recently started doing early release of the main episodes for supporters at the $2 level and up. And at the $5 level, you'll receive a fun touristy postcard from 
Durban, South Africa in the mail. So if you're finding it beneficial and have the means and inclination to help me keep the show going and available to hundreds if not thousands of people to help them get a good night's sleep, please consider signing up at whatever level is comfortable to you to continue supporting my work. But another way that you can be a huge help to the show is simply to spread the word. If there is someone in your life who you think will benefit from listening to Sleepy Time Tales, just let them know. Recommend it to them, and if you recommended the show on social media, make sure to tag me in so that I know and I can thank you and give you a nice shout out. You can tag me at Sleepy Time Tales on Instagram or Twitter. Last but not least, I'm going to give a shout out to the music, which I do every week. It's a fantastic tune by which is called Un Desert by Kumiko. Their music is available on the Free Music Archive and is linked in their website, which you will find linked in the show notes. As they've got some very cool stuff, which they release under various different names that I do recommend checking out. So thank you for your time and back to the show. So what exactly is Sleepy Time Tales? What is it for? It's sort of a strange idea. I mean, it's a podcast that you're supposed to fall asleep to. But lack of sleep is a health crisis in the 21st century, and this is a podcast that is intended to help those it can to get a restful night. Do you find yourself lying awake at night, with your mind spinning and your emotions in turmoil with anxieties of 21st century life? Do you wake up in the middle of the night and find yourself not quite able to doze back off at 3am? I'm here to help. My name is Dave, and I'm your narrator, here to help you into a restful night. Now, I'm someone who has struggled to sleep ever since I was a baby. My parents had many sleepless nights with me for years, and even once I got old enough not to bother them anymore, sleep was always very difficult for me. This continued right through my teen years and my twenties and well into my thirties when I eventually discovered that, uh, Voices, particularly droning male voices, have a tendency to be something like a sedative for me. I was listening to podcasts at night because I couldn't sleep and I'd suddenly find myself waking up having slept through everything that I was trying to listen to. And eventually I started listening to some of those podcasts specifically for the purpose of me getting to sleep. It was fairly recently that I discovered that there are podcasts out there intended to help people to sleep. People that would tell stories or do various things um, specifically to help people to help reach them. I found some that worked very well for me, but when I recommended them to other people, for various reasons, often the narrator's particular voice it just didn't do it for them. So I thought to myself, I've got this boring, droning male voice, so let me give it a bash and see how it goes. So here I am, doing my part to help those that I can. Now every episode of the show starts out with this really long intro. It's something that um, I get the most negative comments about and or the most negative feedback about and I do sympathize with the position. It does go on and on, but um, it's there for a reason. It's there by design. There's two reasons for this intro. The first one is that if you're a new listener, I probably need to explain to you exactly what this is for. What is a sleep cost for? What is, why should you listen to me droning to you? I mean, it's a strange idea. And for people who've been listening to the show for a while, I think for them, the long intro is an important part of that. What we're trying to do is we're trying to create new habits here. Insomnia is a bad habit and we're trying to replace it with a better habit. That is the easiest way to change behavior, habitual behaviors, is to replace them. So for all the listeners that have been here listening for a longer time, this is their chance to pop, pop the podcast on, put it their earbuds in, do their last few little things, brush their teeth, have a good drink of water, do whatever they need to do, and start curling up into their bed, into their space. 
because that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to create habits and trying to build a new space, somewhere to rest, somewhere comfortable, somewhere safe. For some people, there are, well, I think there are a couple of different ways to engage with the show. For me, when I listen to my sleep podcasts, I actually do need something to focus on. I need a story or an event that lets me keep my mind on something specific, on a point, on a story, to stop my mind from spinning out into stresses and anxieties. I need to focus just enough, just enough, not to resist the embrace of sleep when it comes for me. For some people, it's something that I would say is probably a little bit more primal. They just need some kind of white noise. Some people like the sound of the sea or of wind waves or wind in the trees or maybe a falling rain. And some people may be a boring, droning dude's voice. Tonight's story. Tonight's story is from Deep Haven. It's the tale of two young women who decide that they want to spend their summer in an old family home somewhere far away and remote and the adventures that they get up to. But the part of the story that I get and that I tell you tonight is not particularly adventurous. But whatever the story that I tell you is, whatever the story that I tell you is, the point of it is that it shouldn't be keeping you awake. Just listen to it, keep a light mental grip on the story and don't force sleep. Because um, I'm sure many of us, many of us insomniacs have tried to force sleep and it generally doesn't go well. Now obviously I'm hoping that you're asleep before I get to the end of the episode, but if this is your first time here or you've been around, hanging around a while and tonight's a struggle for you, don't feel pressurized. Especially if it's new to you, this may, this, uh, this actually probably won't work for you on your first night. The odds are pretty slim that anything, like any new experience like this is going to work immediately. I ask or suggest that you maybe give me two or three nights to, for you to get used to my voice and the idea of listening to the show and sleeping with earbuds in or however you're going to be listening. Maybe my accent is strange to you. Maybe just the idea is a little bit too odd. It's also possible that maybe one episode isn't enough. I generally come in just under an hour and some people I know, I know at least one listener who listens to a couple of episodes a night before falling asleep. Even though he's not asleep at the time, it still creates a peaceful mindset for him. So... If you're just lying and listening and still not quite able to drift away, it can still be beneficial for you. And after two or three nights, maybe it's working for you. And if it's not, maybe there's other options out there. Maybe you, I'm just not for you. But the most important thing is that you need to try to relax. If you're new to the show and prone to late nights lying staring at the ceiling, it may take a while, even a few days, for this to work for you. So queue up a few episodes or just run through the backlog. What I do with my sleep podcasts is I let them stream all night. I lie down in the dark with my earbuds in and I let them run. Sometimes when I wake up at 3am the stream is still running and I let the voices waft me back to sleep. Sometimes I wake up 30 minutes before my alarm goes. What I usually do then is I carry on listening and I fall right back asleep. It may seem a little bit pointless, but I've got to tell you that sometimes that 30 minutes can be the most restful part of my night. Just allowing myself complete relaxation right before the alarm is just deeply, deeply satisfying. And so you may have the basic idea. You relax and you lie in the dark and while you do that, I'll tell you a tale. So relax, dear listener, my nighttime friend who has elected to lie in the dark, listening to my voice. You will always be safe with me. I'm here to help you to relax, to do a small part to improve your life in a big way. People don't sleep very well these days and it makes lives harder. So I'm here to do my small part to help that. 
to help you to face tomorrow and the day after, well rested and better able to process. One of the central tenets of the show and my intention with it is I'm, I'm trying to share kindness. I'm often a little bit of a sarcastic and I won't say mean-spirited person, but I, I often have a little bit of an edge with my relations with people and I'm trying to get beyond that in my personal life and this show is actually a big part of that for me is I'm trying to be kind and genuinely kind. I'm trying to help people and I need them to help themselves. I need you to be kind to yourself because no matter what I do, if you can't, there's no, no, no help that I can give you. Don't beat yourself up and don't rebuke yourself over not sleeping. Don't get tense if you just can't get yourself over the edge of the sleep, over the edge of sleep, even with me here in your ears trying to help. Frustration is one of the great enemies of a good night's sleep. An intention with this podcast is to short-circuit that frustration, to distract the feeling that we get when we blame ourselves for not being able to let go and drift into the dark. So take a breath. Forgive the fact that you can't sleep and let my voice wash over you. Take another breath. Imagine the warm darkness rising up, inviting you to sleep and to a better life starting tomorrow. And if you can't let go, Forgive yourself and try again tomorrow. If you've had a life of insomnia, sleep is something like an enemy. But it is not your enemy. It is a natural process that we've been pulled away from by stress and life and supposed progress that which shines bright lights in our eyes at all hours. I'm here to work with you. To create a safe space. A cocoon in which you can curl up and allow nature to take its course. So if you're still with me, thank you for staying. If you're already asleep, we'll chat again soon. And of course, you aren't hearing me, except maybe in a dream. Deep Haven by Sarah Orne Jewett. Kate Lancaster's Plan I had been spending the winter in Boston and Kate Lancaster and I had been together a great deal, for we are the best of friends. It happened that the morning when the story begins I had waked up feeling sorry and as if something dreadful were going to happen. There did not seem to be any good reason for it, so I undertook to discourage myself more by thinking that it would soon be time to leave town and how much I should miss being with Kate and my other friends. My mind was still disquieted when I went down to breakfast, but beside my plate I found, with a hoped-for letter from my father, a note from Kate. To this day I have never known any explanation of that depression of my spirits, and I hope that the good luck which followed will help some reader to lose fear, and to smile at such shadows of any chance to come. Kate had evidently written to me in an excited state of mind, for her note was not so trig-looking as usual, but this is what she said. Dear Helen, I have a plan, I think it is a most delightful plan, in which you and I are chief characters. Promise that you will say yes, if you do not you will have to remember that all your life that you broke a girl's heart. Come round early and lunch with me and dine with me. I'm to be all alone and it's a long story and will need a great deal of talking over. K. I showed this note to my aunt and soon went round, very much interested. My latchkey opened the Lancaster's door and I hurried to the parlour where I heard my friend practising with great diligence. I went up to her and she turned her head and kissed me solemnly. You need not smile, we are not sentimental girls and are both much averse to indiscriminate kissing though I have not the adroit habit of shying in which Kate is proficient. I would sometimes be impolite in anyone else, but she shies so affectionately. Won't you sit down, dear, she said with great ceremony, and went on with her playing, which was abominable that morning. Her fingers stepped on each other and whatever the tune might have been in reality, it certainly had a most remarkable incoherence as I heard it then. I took up the new Littell and made believe read it, 
and finally threw it at Kate. You would have thought we were two children. Have you heard that my great aunt, Miss Catherine Brandon of Deephaven, is dead? I knew that she had died in November, at least six months before. Don't be nonsensical, Kate, said I. What is it you are going to tell me? My great aunt died very old and was the last of her generation. She had a sister and three brothers, one of whom had the honour of being my grandfather. Mama is sole heir to the family estates in Deephaven, wharf property and all, and it is a great inconvenience to her. The house is a charming old house and some of my ancestors who followed the sea brought home the greater part of its furnishings. Miss Catherine was a person who ignored all frivolities and her house was as sedate as herself. I have been there but little, for when I was a child my aunt found no pleasure in the society of noisy children who upset her treasures, and when I was older she did not care to see strangers, and after I left school she grew more and more feeble. I had not been there for two years when she died. Mama went down very often. The town is a quaint old place which has seen better days. There are high rocks at the shore and there is a beach and there are woods inland and hills and there is the sea. It might be dull and deep haven for two young ladies who are, were fond of gay society and dependent upon excitement, I suppose. But for two little girls who were fond of each other and could play in the boats and dig and build houses in the sea sand and gather shells and carry their dolls wherever they went, what could be pleasanter? Nothing, I said promptly. Kate had told this a little at a time, with a few appropriate bars of music between, which suddenly reminded me of the story of a Chinese procession which I'd read in one of Marriott's novels when I was a child. A thousand white elephants richly caparisoned, Titum, Tilly Lily, and so on, for a page or two. She seemed to have finished her story, for that time, and while it was dawning upon me what she meant, she sang a bit from one of Jean Engelow's verses. Will you step aboard, my dearest? for the high seas that lie before us, and then came over to sit beside me and tell me the whole story in a more sensible fashion. You know that my father has been meaning to go to England in the autumn? Yesterday he told us that he is to leave in a month and will be away all summer, and Mama is going with him. Jack and Willie are jo to join a party of their classmates who are to spend nearly the whole of the long vacation at Lake Superior. I don't care to go abroad again now, and I do not like any plan that was proposed to me. Aunt Anna was here all the afternoon, and she is going to take a house in Newport, which is very pleasant and unexpected, for she hates housekeeping. Mama thought, of course, that I would go with her, but I did not wish to do that, and it was the only result in me keeping house for her visitors, whom I know very little, and she will be much more free and independent by herself. Besides, she can have my room if I am not there. I have promised to make her a long visit in Baltimore next winter instead. I told Mama that I should like to stay here and go away when I choose. There are ever so many visits which I have promised. I could stay with you and your Aunt Mary at Lennox if she goes there for a while, and I have always wished her to spend a summer in town, but Mama did not encourage that at all. In the evening, Papa gave her a letter which had come from Mr. Dockham, the man who takes care of Aunt Catherine's place, and the most charming idea came into my head, and I said I meant to spend my summer in Deephaven. At first they laughed at me, and they said I might go if I choose, and at last they thought nothing could be pleasanter, and Mama wishes she were going herself. I asked if she did not think you would be the best person to keep me company, and she does, and Papa announced that he was just going to suggest my asking you. I asked if she did not think that you would be the best person to keep me company, and she does, and Papa announced that he was just going to suggest my asking you. I am to take Anne and Maggie, who will be overjoyed, for they came from that part of the country, and the other servants are to go with Aunt Anna, and old Nora will take care of this house as she always does. Perhaps you and I will come up to town once in a while for a few days. We shall have such jolly housekeeping. Mama and I sat up very late last night, and everything is planned. Mr. Dockham's house is very near Aunt Catherine's, so we shall not be lonely, though I know you're no more afraid of that than I. Oh, Helen, won't you go? Do you think it took me long to decide? Mr. and Mrs. Lancaster sailed the 10th of June, 
and my Aunt Mary went to spend a summer among the Berkshire Hills. So I was at the Lancasters ready to welcome Kate when she came home after having said goodbye to her father and mother. We meant to go to Deep Haven in a week, but were obliged to stay in town longer. Boston was nearly deserted of our friends at the last, and we used to take quiet walks in the cool of the evening after dinner, up and down the street or sit on the front steps in company with the servants left in charge of the other houses, who also sometimes walked up and down and looked at us wonderingly. We had much shopping to do in the daytime, for there was a probability of us spending many days indoors. And as we were not to be near any large town, and did not mean to come to Boston for weeks at least, there was a great deal to be remembered and arranged. We enjoyed making our plans and deciding what we should want, and going to the shops together. I think we felt most important the day we conferred with Anne and made our list of the provisions which must be ordered. This was being housekeepers in earnest. Mr. Dockham happened to come to town and we sent Anne and Maggie, with most of our boxes, to Deep Haven and his company a day or two before we were ready to go ourselves. And when we reached there, the house was opened and in order for us. On our journey to Deep Haven, we left the railway 12 miles from that place and took passage in a stagecoach. There was only one passenger besides ourselves. She was a rather large, thin, weather-beaten woman and looked so tired and lonesome and good-natured that I could not help saying it was very dusty. And she was apparently delighted to answer that she should think everyone was sweeping. And she always felt, after being in the cars a while, as if she had been taken all to pieces and left in the different places. And this was the beginning of our friendship with Mrs. Q. After this conversation, we looked industriously out of the window into the pastures and pine woods. I had given up my seat to her, for I do not mind riding backwards in the least, and you would have thought that I had done her the greatest favour of her life. I think she was the most grateful of women, and I was often reminded of a remark one of my friends once made about someone. If you gave Bessie a half sheet of letter paper, she behaved to you as if it was the most exquisite of presents. Kate and I had some fruit left in our lunch basket and divided it with Mrs. Q. But after the first mouthful, we looked at each other in dismay. Lemons with oranges close on, aren't they? said she as Kate threw hers out of the window, and mine went after it for company. And after this, we began to be very friendly indeed. We both liked the old woman. There was something so straightforward and kindly about her. Are you going to Deep Haven, dear? she asked me. And then, I wonder if you're going to stay long. All summer? Well, that's clever. I do hope you'll come out to the light to see me. Young folks must always like my place. Most likely your friends will fetch you. Do you know the Brandon house? asked Kate. Well, as I do the meeting house. There. I wonder I didn't know from the beginning, but I have been a trying all the way to settle it who you could be. I have been up country some weeks stopping with my mother, and she seemed so set to have me stay till strawberry time, and would hardly let me come now. You see, she's getting to be old. Why, every time I've come away for 15 years, she said it was the last time I'd ever see her. But she's a dreadful smart woman of her age. He wrote me some of Mrs. Lancaster's folks are coming to take the Brandon house this summer, and so you're the ones? It's a slightly old place. I used to go and see Miss Catherine. She must have left a power of China away. She set a great deal by the house and she kept everything just as it used to be in her mother's day. Then you live in Deep Haven too? asked Kate. I've been here the better part of my life. I was raised up among the hills in Vermont and I shall always be a real upcountry woman if I live here a hundred years. The sea doesn't come natural to me. It kind of worries me, though you won't find a happier woman than I, be Longshore. When I was first married, he had a schooner and went to the banks. And once he was off on a whaling voyage, and I hope her men never come to so long a three years as those were again, though I was up to mother's. Before I was married, he had been most everywhere. When he came home that time from whaling, he found out taking it so to heart that he said he'd never go off again. And then he got the chance to keep Deep Haven light, and we've lived there 17 years come January. There isn't great pay, but then nobody tries to get it away from us. And we've got sus to be contented if it is lonesome in winter. 
Do you really live in the lighthouse? I remember how I used to beg to be taken out there when I was a child and how I used to watch for the light at night, said Kate enthusiastically. So began a friendship which we both still treasure, for knowing Mrs. Q was one of the pleasantest things which happened to us in that delightful summer. And she used to do so much for our pleasure and was so good to us. When we went out to the lighthouse for the last time to say goodbye, we were very sorry girls indeed. We had no idea until then how much she cared for us, and her affection touched us very much. She told us that she loved us as if we belonged to her, and begged us not to forget her, as if we ever could, and to remember that there was always a home and a warm heart for us if she were alive. Kate and I have often agreed that few of our acquaintances are half so entertaining. Her comparisons were most striking and amusing, and her comments upon the books she read, for she was a great reader, were very shrewd and clever and always to the point. She was never out of temper, even when the barrels of oil were being rolled across her kitchen floor. And she was such a wise woman. This stage ride, which we expected to find tiresome, we enjoyed very much. And we were glad to think, when the coach stopped, and he came to meet her with great satisfaction, that we had one friend in Deep Haven at all events. I liked the house from my very first sight of it. It stood behind a row of poplars which were as green and flourishing as the poplars which stand in stately processions in the fields around Quebec. It was an imposing great white house and the lilacs were tall and there were crowds of rose bushes, not yet out of bloom. And there were box borders and there were great elms at the side of the house and down the road. The hall door stood wide open and my hostess turned to me as we went in, with one of her sweet sudden smiles. Won't we have a good time, Nellie? said she, and I thought we should. So our summer's housekeeping began in a most pleasant fashion. It was just at sunset, and Anne's and Maggie's presence made the house seem familiar at once. Maggie had been unpacking for us, and there was a delicious supper ready for the hungry girls. Later in the evening we went down to the shore, which was not very far away. The fresh sea air was welcome after the dusty day and it seemed so quiet and pleasant in Deep Haven. The Brandon House and the Lighthouse I do not know that the Brandon House is really very remarkable, but I never have been in one that interested me in the same way. Kate used to recount to select audiences at school some of her experiences with her Aunt Catherine, and it was popularly believed that she once carried down some indestructible picture books when they were first in fashion and the old lady basted them for her to hem around the edges at the rate of two a day. It may have been fabulous. It was impossible to imagine any children in the old place. Everything was for grown people. Even the stair railing was too high to slide down on. The chairs looked as if they'd been put at the furnishing of the house in their places, and there they meant to remain. The carpets were particularly interesting, and I remember Kate's pointing out to me one day a great square figure in one, and telling me she used to keep house there with her dolls for lack of a better playhouse. And if one of them chanced to fall outside the boundary strap, it was immediately put to bed with a cold. It is a house with great possibilities. It might easily be made charming. There are four very large rooms on the lower floor and six above, a wide hall in each story and a fascinating garret over the hall, where were many mysterious old chests and boxes, in one of which we find Kate's grandmother's love letters and you may be sure the vista of rummages which Mrs. Lancaster had laughed about was explored to its very end. The rooms all have elaborate cornices, and the lower hall is very fine, with an archway dividing it, and panellings of all sorts, and a great door at each end through which the lilacs in front and the old pensioner plum trees in the garden are seen exchanging bows and gestures. Coming from the Lancaster's high city house, it did not seem as if we had to go upstairs at all there, for every step of the stairway was so broad and low, and you came halfway to a square landing with an old straight-backed chair in each farther corner, and between them a large round-top window with a cushioned seat looking out onto the garden and the village, the hills far inland, and the sunset beyond all. Then you turn and go up a few more steps to the upper hall, where we used to stay a great deal. There were more old chairs and a pair of remarkable sofas on which we used to deposit the treasures we collected in our wanderings. 
The wide window, which looks out on the lilacs and the sea, was a favorite seat of ours. Facing each other on each side of it are two old secretaries, and one of them we ascertain to be the hiding place of secret drawers, in which may be found valuable records deposited by ourselves one rainy day when we first explored it. We wrote between us a tragic journal on some yellow old letter paper we found in the desk. We put it in the most hidden drawer by itself and flatter ourselves that it will be regarded with great interest some time or the other. Of one of the front rooms, the best chamber, we stood rather in dread. It is very remarkable that there seem to be no ghost stories connected with any part of the house, particularly this. We are neither of us nervous, but there is something dismal about the room. The huge curtain bed and immense easy chairs, windows and everything were draped in some old-fashioned kind of white cloth, which always seemed to be waving and moving about of itself. The carpets, most singularly coloured with dark reds and indescribable greys and browns, and the pattern, after a whole summer's study, could never be followed with one's eye. The paper was captured in a French prize, somewhere in the time of the last century and part of the figure was shaggy, and therein little spiders found habitation and went visiting their acquaintances across the shiny places. The colour was an unearthly pink and a forbidding maroon, with dim white spots which gave it the appearance of having moulded. It made you low-spirited to look long in the mirror, and the great lounge one could not have a cheerful associations with. After hearing that Miss Brandon herself did not like it, having seen so many of her relatives lie there dead. There were fantastic china ornaments from Bible subjects on the mantel, and the only picture was one of the Maid of Orléans tied with unnecessarily strong rope to a very stout stake. The best parlour was also rarely used, because all the portraits which hung there had for some unaccountable reason taken a violent dislike to us, and followed us suspiciously with their eyes. The furniture was stately and very uncomfortable, and there was something about the room which suggested an invisible funeral. There is not much to say about the dining room. It was not especially interesting, though the sea was in sight from one of the windows. There were some old Dutch pictures on the wall, so dark that one could scarcely make out what they were meant to represent, and one or two engravings. There was a huge sideboard which Kate had brought down from Boston, Miss Brandon's own silver, which had stood there for many years and looked so much more at home and in place than any other possibly could have looked. Kate also found in the closet the three great decanters with silver labels chained around their necks, which had always been the companions of the tea service in her aunt's lifetime. From the little closets in the sideboard there came a most significant odour of cake and wine whenever one opened the doors. We used Miss Brandon's beautiful old blue India china which she had given to Kate and which had been carefully packed all winter. Kate sat at the head and I at the foot of the round table, and I must confess that we were apt to have either a feast or famine, for at first we often forgot to provide our dinners. If this were the case, Maggie was sure to serve us with the most derisive elegance and make us wait for us as much ceremony as she thought necessary for one of Miss Lancaster's dinner parties. The West Parlour was our favourite room downstairs. It had a great fireplace framed in blue and white Dutch tiles, which ingeniously and instructively represented the careers of the good and the bad man, the starting place of each being a very singular cradle in the centre at the top. The last two of each series was very high art. A great coffin stands in the foreground of each and the virtuous man is being led off by two disagreeable looking angels, while the wicked one is hastening from an indescribable but unpleasant assemblage of claws and horns and eyes which is rapidly advancing from the distance, open-mouthed and bringing a chain with it. There was a large cabinet holding all the small curiosities and knick-knacks there seemed to be no other place for. Odd china figures and cups and vases, unaccountable Chinese carvings and exquisite corals and seashells, minerals and Swiss woodwork and articles of virtue from the South Seas. Underneath were stored boxes of letters and old magazines for this was one of the houses where nothing seems to have been thrown away. In one parting we found a parcel of old manuscript sermons, the existence of which was a mystery, 
until Kate remembered there had been a gifted son of the house who entered the ministry and soon died. The windows had each a pane of stained glass, and on the wide sills we used to put our immense bouquets of field flowers. There was one place which I liked, and sat in more than any other. The chimney filled nearly the whole side of the room, all but this little corner where there was just room for a very comfortable hard-backed cushioned chair, and a narrow window where I always had a bunch of fresh green ferns and a tall champagne glass. I used to write there often and always sat there when Kate sang and played. She sent for a tuner and used to successfully coax the long imprisoned music from the antiquated piano and sing for her visitors by the hour. She almost always sang her oldest songs, for they seemed most in keeping with everything about us. I used to fancy that the portraits liked our being there. There was one young girl who seemed solitary and forlorn among the rest in the room, who were all middle-aged. For their part, they looked amiable, but rather unhappy, as if she had come in and interrupted their conversation. We both grew very fond of her, and it seemed, when we went in the last morning on purpose to take leave of her, as if she looked at us imploringly. She was soon afterward boxed up and now enjoys society after her own heart in Kate's room in Boston. There was the largest sofa I ever saw opposite the fireplace. It must have been brought in in pieces and built in the room. It was broad enough for Kate and me to lie on together and very high and square, but there was a pile of soft cushions at one end. We used to enjoy it greatly in September, when the evenings were long and cool, and we had many candles and a fire, and crickets too, on the hearth, and the dear dog lying on the rug. I remember one rainy night, just before Miss Tennant and Kitty Bruce went away, we had a real driftwood fire and blew out the lights and told stories. Miss Margaret knows so many and tells them so well. Kate and I were unusually entertaining. We became familiar with the family record of the town and could recount marvellous adventures by land and sea and ghost stories by the dozen. We had never either of us been a society consisting of so many travelled people. Hardly a man but had been in most of his life at the sea. Speaking of ghost stories, I must tell you that once in summer two Cambridge girls who were spending a week with us unwisely enticed us into giving them some thrilling recitals which nearly frightened them out of their wits, and Kate and I were finally in terror ourselves. We had all been on the sofa in the dark, singing and talking, and were waiting in great suspense after I had finished one of such particular horror that I declared it should be the last, when we heard footsteps on the hall stairs. There were lights in the dining room which shone faintly through the half-closed door, and we saw something white and shapeless come down, and clutched each other's gowns in agony. It was only Kate's dog, who came in and laid his head in her lap and slept peacefully. We thought we could not sleep a wink after this, and I bravely went to learn out the light to see my watch, and finding it was past twelve we concluded to sit up all night and go down to the shore at sunrise. It would be so much easier than getting up early some morning. We had been out rowing and had taken a long walk the day before and were obliged to dance and make other light exertions to keep ourselves awake at one time. We lunched at two and I never shall forget the sunrise that morning. But we were singularly quiet and abstracted that day and indeed for several days after Deephaven was a land in which it seemed always afternoon. We breakfasted so late. As Mrs. Q had said, there was a power of China. Kate and I were convinced that the lives of her grandmothers must have been spent in giving tea parties. We counted ten sets of cups besides quantities of stray ones, and some members of the family had evidently devoted her time to making a collection of pictures. There was an escritoire in Miss Brandon's own room, which we looked over one day. There was a little package of letters, ship letters mostly, tied with very pale and tired-looking blue ribbon. They were in a drawer with a locket holding a faded miniature on ivory and a lock of brown hair. And there were also some dry twigs and bits of leaf which had long ago been bright wild roses, such as still bloom among the deep haven rocks. Kate said that she had often heard her mother wonder why her aunt had never cared to marry, for she had had chances enough, doubtless, and had been rich and handsome and finely educated. 
So there was a sailor lover after all, and perhaps he had been lost at sea, and she faithfully kept the secret, never mourning outwardly. And I always thought her the most matter-of-fact old lady, said Kate. Yet here's her romance after all. We put the letters outside on a chair to read, but afterwards carefully replaced them without untying them. I'm glad we did. There were other letters which we did read, and which interested us very much. Letters from her girlfriends written in the boarding school vacations and just after she finished school. Those in one of the smaller packages were charming. It must have been such a bright, nice girl who wrote them. They were very few and were tied with a black ribbon and marked on the outside in girlish writing. My dearest friend, Dolly McAllister, died September 3rd, 1809, aged 18. The ribbon had evidently been untied and the letters read many times. One began, My dear delightful kitten, I am quite overjoyed to find my father has business which will force him to go to Deephaven next week. And he kindly says if there is no more rain, I may ride with him to see you. I will surely come, for if there is a danger of spattering my gown and he bids me stay at home, I shall go galloping after him and overtake him when it is too late to send me back. I have so much to tell you. I wish I knew more about the visit. Poor Miss Catherine. It made us sad to look over these treasures of her girlhood. There were her compositions and exercise books, some samplers and queer little keepsakes, withered flowers and some pebbles and other things of like value, with which there was probably some pleasant association. I only think of her keeping them all her days, said I to Kate. I am continually throwing some relic of the kind away because I forget why I have it. There was a box in the lower part which Kate was glad to find, for she had heard her mother wonder if some such things were not in existence. It held a crucifix and a mass book and some rosaries, and Kate told me Miss Catherine's youngest and favorite brother had become a Roman Catholic while studying in Europe. It was a dreadful blow to the family, for in those days there could have been few deeper disgraces to the Brandon family than have one of its sons go to popery. Only Miss Catherine treated him with kindness, and after a time he disappeared without telling even her where he was going, and was only heard from indirectly once or twice afterwards. It was a great grief to her. And Mama knows, said Kate, that she always had a lingering hope of his return, for one of the last times she saw Aunt Catherine before she was ill, she spoke of soon going to be with all the rest, and said, So your Uncle Henry, dear, and stopped and smiled sadly. You'll think me a very foolish old woman, but I never quite gave up thinking he might come home. Mrs. Q did the honors of the lighthouse thoroughly on our first visit, but I think we rarely went to see her that we did not make some entertaining discovery. Mr. Q's nephew, a guileless youth of forty, lived with them, and the two men were of a mechanical turn and had invented numerous aids to housekeeping appendages to the stove and fixtures on the walls for everything that could be hung up, catches in the floor to hold the doors open and ingenious apparatus to close them, but above all a system of barring and bolting for the wide four-door, which would have disconcerted an energetic battering ram. After all this work being expended, Mrs. Q informed us that it was usually wide open all night in summer weather. On the back of this door I discovered one day a row of marks and asked for their significance. It seemed that Mrs. Q had attempted one summer to keep count of the number of people who inquired about the depredations of the neighbor's chickens. Mrs. Q's bedroom was partly devoted to the fine arts. There was a large collection of likenesses of her relatives and friends on the wall, which was interesting in the extreme. Mrs. Q was always much pleased to tell their names, and her remarks about any feature not exactly perfect were very searching and critical. That's my eldest brother's wife. Clorinthy Adams, that was. She's well featured, if it were not for her nose, and that looks as if it had been thrown at her, and she wasn't particular about having it on firm in hopes of getting a better one. She sets by her looks, though. There were often sailing parties that came there from up and down the coast. One day, Kate and I were spending the afternoon at the light. We had been fishing and were sitting in the doorway, listening to a reminiscence of the winter Mrs. Q kept school at the Four Corners. Saw a boatful coming and all lost our tempers. Mrs. Q had a lame ankle, and Kate offered to go up with the visitors. 
There were some girls and young men who stood on the rocks a while and then asked us, with much better manners than the people who usually came, if they could see the lighthouse, and Kate led the way. She was dressed that day in a costume we both frequently wore, of grey skirts and blue sailor jacket, and her boots were much worse for wear. The celebrated Lancaster complexion was rather darkened by the sun. Mrs. Q expressed a wish to know what questions they would ask her, and I followed after a few minutes. They seemed to have finished asking about the lantern and to have become personal. Don't you get tired staying here? No, indeed, said Kate. Is that your sister downstairs? No, I have no sister. I should think you would wish she was. Aren't you ever lonesome? Everybody is sometimes, said Kate. But it's such a lonesome place, said one of the girls. I should think you would work away. I live in Boston. Why, it's so awful quiet. Nothing but the water and the wind when it blows. And I think either of them is worse than nothing. And only this little bit of a rocky place. I should want to go to walk. I heard Kate pleasantly refuse the offer of pay for her services. And then they began to come down the steep stairs, laughing and chattering with each other. Kate stayed behind to close the doors and leave everything all right. And the girl who had talked the most waited too. And when they were on the stairs just above me, and the others out of hearing, she said, You're real good to show us the things. I guess you'll think I'm silly, but I do like you ever so much. I wish you would come to Boston. I'm in a real nice store. On Winter Street. And they will want new saleswomen in October. Perhaps you could be at my counter and I'd teach you and you could board with me. I've got a real comfortable room and I suppose I might have more things, for I get good pay. But I like to send money home to mother. I'm at my aunt's now, but I'm going back next Monday, and if you'll tell me what your name is, I'll find out for certain about the place and write you. My name's Mary Wendell. I knew by Kate's voice that this had touched her. You are very kind, thank you heartily, said she, but I cannot go and work with you. I should like to know more about you. I live in Boston too. My friend and I are staying over in Deep Haven for the summer only and she held out her hand to the girl whose face had changed from its first expression of earnest good humour to a very startled one, and when she noticed Kate's hand and a ring of hers which had been turned around, she looked really frightened. Oh, will you please excuse me, she said, blushing. I ought to have known better, but you showed us round so willingly and I never thought of your not living here. I didn't mean to be rude. Of course you did not, and you were not. I'm very glad you said it and glad you like me, said Kate. And just then the party called the girl and she hurried away, and I joined Kate. Then you heard it all. That was worth having, said she. She was such an honest little soul and I mean to look for her when I get home. Sometimes we used to go out to the light early in the morning with the fishermen who went that way to the fishing grounds. But we usually made the voyage early in the afternoon if it were not too hot. And we went fishing off the rocks or sat in the house with Mrs. Q who often related some of her Vermont experiences. Or Mr. Q would tell us surprising sea stories and ghost stories like a storybook sailor. Then we would have an unreasonably good supper and afterwards climb the ladder to the lantern to see the ships lighted and sit there for a while watching the ships and the sunset. Almost all the coasters came in sight of Deep Haven, and the sea outside the light was the Grand Highway. Twice from the lighthouse we saw a yacht squadron like a flock of great white birds. As for the sunsets, it used to seem often as if we were near the heart of them, for the sea all around us caught the colour of the clouds, and though the glory was wonderful, I remember best one still evening when there was a bank of grey heavy clouds in the west, shutting down like a curtain, and the sea was silver-coloured. You could look under and beyond the curtain of the clouds into the palest, clearest yellow sky. There was a little black boat in the distance drifting slowly, climbing one white wave after another as if it were bound out into that other world beyond. But presently the sun came from behind the clouds and the dazzling golden light changed the look of everything. And it was the time then to say one thought it was a beautiful sunset, while before one could only keep very still and watch the boat and wonder if heaven would not be somehow like that far faint colour which was neither sea nor sky. When we came down from the lighthouse and it grew late, we would beg for an hour or two longer on the water and row away in the twilight far out from land. Where, with our faces turned from the light, it seemed as if we were alone, and the sea shoreless, 
And as the darkness closed around us softly, we watched the stars come out. And we're always glad to see Kate's star and my star, which we had chosen when we were children. I used long ago to be sure of one thing, that however far away heaven might be, it could not be out of sight of the stars. Sometimes in the evening we waited out at sea for the moonrise, and then we would take the oars again and go slowly in, once in a while singing or talking, but oftenest silent. Thanks again for joining me on this episode of Sleepy Time Tales, the podcast designed around a bedtime story to help you get a restful night. New episodes will be released every Sunday night to give you something fresh to help you rest in a new week. But make sure to subscribe in whatever service you use so that you get new episodes whenever they come out. A reminder that the music for the show is Undeser Bakumiku. Check out more of their work on their website, which you will find linked in the show notes. Good night and sweet dreams.